Stuka Joe here. Welcome to this Mechanics at Play video. I had announced that I was going to do um, this video showing some examples of play, but I've changed my mind. I'm going to play one full turn of this game, which is Stalingrad Verdun on the Volga. Area impulse game about the battle for the city of Stalingrad from September to October 1942. And I will be explaining the rules as I go along so that you can... Uh, get a grasp of how this game plays. Now, I will be using uh, these cards, and these cards don't come with the game. By the time you see this video, they will be in uh, this game's page at BGG. This game includes a player aid card, which is one 8.5 by 11 inch card stock uh, player aid card with uh, many of the tables and charts needed to play the game, but it doesn't have everything that I think it should have. For example, it has a very uh, a small sequence of play. This one is a bit expanded, and it has some reminders of specific rules there so that I don't forget. So uh, that's one of the cards that you'll see. There's also a card for Turn 1 Special Rules. These are some special rules that reflect the German surprise attack. And then, this is another card that tells you all the uses for the advantage marker, which is very important in this game. The advantage marker is a mechanism that mitigates bad luck in the game. But it has a cost. Of course, you pass the advantage to the other player, who then can use it. And then, in the rule book, there's a breakdown of what each side can do during an assault impulse, but it is in just one outline and it tells you for example that the Soviets can attempt to build fortifications just one outline so I decided to separate it in two outlines here's everything the Germans can do and here's everything the Soviets can do so uh, we will be showing these cards when we get to a German assault impulse as well as a Soviet assault impulse and finally we have uh, what a player can do during a non-assault impulse and it's summarized there also. So I'll be using these cards, showing them as we go along uh, playing the game. Now, you don't have to uh, cut these cards up like regular playing cards. You can use the player aid like this. When, if you print it, it's going to come out like this. And just use it as a regular player aid if you find it useful. So let's start with turn one of uh, Stalingrad Verdun on the Volga, and this is the standard game. So we will play turn one, and we place the turn marker on the attack side in turn number one. And there's some special rules for turn one. Uh, the impulses always start with the Soviet impulse followed by the German impulse, but in turn one, the first Soviet impulse is skipped. We start with the German impulse. Also, the Germans cannot use redeployment or troop transfer, they elect to conduct a non-assault impulse. You see there's, there's five things uh, they can choose from, uh, one to do, and uh, they cannot redeploy nor conduct troop transfers. And the Germans ignore the lo any logistical dice roll that results in a lo logistical pause. So if the Germans roll uh, with two dice, uh, total that is equal to the current impulse, normally that causes a logistical pause. The Germans can't conduct any more assault impulses for the rest of the turn. That is ignored, so that there won't be a logistical pause in turn one. And the Germans can use the advantage marker for a dual purpose. Here's the advantage marker. It can be used to declare a maximum attack. A maximum attack is declared when the Germans attack and lose. They are repulsed. Maximum attack converts that repulse to a stalemate. So they can use it for that purpose, and if that same dice roll uh, changed daylight into nighttime, it can also be used to prolong daylight. So we begin turn one with the reinforcement phase. The Germans place their reinforcements first, then the Soviets do so, and they have to place theirs in zones L or M. Those are the zones across the Volga on the eastern bank of the Volga. And the exception are worker units, those you can place directly into urban areas in the city. There's no worker units as turn 
one reinforcements. So let's start with the reinforcement phase. And we see that for turn one, the Germans have an independent infantry and panzer regiment. German reinforcements are placed in any of perimeter zones D, E, F, or G. Germans will place the uh, infantry unit in zone E and the armored or panzer regiment in zone D. Now the Soviets placed their reinforcements. They received the 13th Guard Rifle Division. This is a famous division commanded by uh, Rodimstev. You can see it's a pretty elite unit. All its regiments have a strength of five and an independent infantry and tank unit. They have to be placed either in Zone L, Dienishni, or Zone M, which is Krasnaya Sloboda. And uh, from these zones, later during night impulses, they must attempt to cross the Volga into the city. So the independent units will be placed in Zone L. And the 13th Guards Rifle Division will be placed in Zone M. Now we move into the maneuvers phase, and this is where most of the action of the game occurs. Up to 12 impulses may happen, but again, that is very improbable. And normally we start with Soviet Impulse 1, but because of the special turn 1 rule, that is skipped, and we go to German Impulse 1. So here the Germans select either conducting an assault impulse or a non-assault impulse. And if they conduct an assault impulse, they can move units from one or two areas and they can attempt to clear rubble and conduct combat. And if successful in combat, there may be an overrun, in which case they can move one more area and conduct combat once again. Now, if they select the non-assault impulse, they must select one of the actions stated there. Now, regroup means that uh, they could move every friendly unit on the map one area where there's some restrictions. They cannot move into areas where there are enemy units. Or they could conduct redeployment, that is, activating a unit in one area and moving it an unlimited number of areas over friendly uh, areas. Or they can conduct a troop transfer, flipping a reduced strength unit to full strength, and then another unit of the same type, flipping it from full strength to reduced strength. Or they can conduct consolidation, again, flip a reduced strength unit to full strength, and then eliminating another unit of the same type, which is at reduced strength. Or they can take a pass impulse in which nothing is done. Now, for the first turn, if they select a non-assault impulse, they cannot conduct redeployment nor troop transfer. And this is the first uh, turn of the game. It's a daylight impulse. Uh, we're in impulse number one. So the Germans, of course, will select an assault impulse. And there's a special rule for the Germans. Combined operations, and it only applies during daylight impulses, the Germans can activate units from two areas instead of one uh, in order to conduct uh, these actions, movement and combat. And they can conduct uh, action sequentially, that is, with units of one area first and then the other, or at the same time simultaneously. We could move units from both areas and then conduct combat together. So let's see what kind of assault impulse the Germans will uh, undertake and which areas they will activate. Now, one very important area in this uh, map is Mamayev Kurgan. You see it there, area 33, control of that area will make Volga crossings very costly for the Soviets. And Mamayev Kurgan is three areas away from the German units that are in area 18. So we will be activating area 18 and taking a look at how, how they fare, and then we can activate some other areas. So this is going to be a sequential activation of two German areas because, again, 
they are conducting combined operations. It's a daylight turn and they can activate two areas. So we'll conduct movement with units from that area and then uh, any attempt to clear rubble even though, but there's no rubble in any of the areas they will move into or out of. And then any combat resolution, any overrun movement, and notice that the Soviets have a hero marker and uh, they can use it once per turn to cancel an overrun. And if there's an overrun, uh, there could be potentially another attempt to clear rubble and finally overrun combat. But we start with movement. In this game, the movement costs are dependent mostly on the proximity of enemy units. And uh, you're going to see here that these German units all have movement allowances of four. Entering an area with uh, uh, at least one full strength enemy unit costs four movement points. So all four movement points will be expended by entering into area 20. And also, if you enter an area that is solely occupied by enemy units, your units has, have to stop anyway. So that's the end of movement. And now we go to combat resolution. Notice there was no attempt to clear rubble because there was no rubble in the area that the units moved out of or into. So combat resolution. And it's basically the attacker picks a lead attack unit, the defender a lead defensive unit. Then artillery support markers are assigned. Attacker decides if he will assign one and then the defender can assign one. And then the Germans during daylight can assign an air support marker. Then we tabulate the final attack and defense values. We roll 2d6s for each side, and there's always the possibility of rubble being created, but only in urban areas. This particular attack is not in an urban area. And then uh, we apply the combat results that may cause an overrun if the defenders cannot satisfy the number of attrition points called for in case that there is a successful attack. So we start by declaring an attacking unit and it'll be the 194th uh, regiment of the 71st Infantry Division. Now the Soviets have to select a lead defensive unit and they select the 42nd Naval Infantry Brigade. Now uh, both sides select any artillery support starting with the attacking Germans. Germans can support their attack with one artillery support marker and uh, they have to have at least one unit of the corresponding formation uh, stated in the marker. And this is an attack by four units of the 71st Infantry Division and they will support the attack with the artillery support marker for that division. And we place a marker in the affected area. The Soviets don't have artillery for each of their divisions. It's just two artillery support markers for the entire 62nd Army. And um, support by artillery uh, can only happen once per turn. After that, it is used and cannot be used again until the next turn. So the Soviets have to decide whether they will support their defense with one of these artillery markers or not. And these artillery markers only provide one combat factor to be added to the defense, different from when they're used offensively, they provide two. And they will use one of their two artillery support markers. So it is also placed in the affected area. Now the Germans have to decide if they will use one of their air support markers. And different from artillery support markers, these air support markers are available in every daylight impulse and they provide a strength equal to the roll of 1d6. Uh, again, artillery and attack only provides uh, an addition of two strength points. Uh, the air units can be anything from 1 to 6, and the Germans will use one of their air support markers. And it is placed in the area. Now we calculate the final attack and defense values. For the Germans, the combat factor of the lead unit 4 plus one for each additional unit participating, so that's plus three, seven, and then plus one because there's a divisional integrity bonus. They have at least three units from the same division participating, so that's eight right now, and then they have an artillery support marker which adds two, so we're at 
10, and now we have to roll for the air support marker to see how many factors it will contribute. And it adds 4 for a total of 14. 14 is the total of attack value of the Germans. Now we calculate the total defense value of the Soviets. The lead defensive unit has a combat rating of 3, plus 1 for an additional defensive unit. That's 4, plus 2 for the terrain effects modifier of uh, area 20. So we're at 6. And the Soviet artillery provides a plus 1, so that is 7. So the Germans have an attack value of 14, the Soviets a defense value of 7. Now each side rolls two dice and adds the total rolled to their respective values. Here each side rolled a 6, so the Germans end up with an attack total of 20, and the Soviets a defense total of 13. The German total is greater, so this is a German success, and the Soviets have to now absorb in losses the difference in points which is seven attrition points. So the Soviets have to absorb seven attrition points. The elimination of a fresh unit absorbs three. So they start by eliminating the 42nd Naval Infantry Brigade. That takes care of three. And they also eliminate the remaining infantry unit. So the Soviets have fulfilled six attrition points, but there's one more point and they will not be able to absorb it. So that will be an overrun. But before we conduct the overrun, the lead attacking unit of the Germans has to be reduced. And that's one characteristic that this game has. No matter what is the result, the attacker's lead attacking unit will always be reduced. And we remove the Soviet control marker. German control is denoted by the absence of a Soviet control marker. So now the Germans can conduct an overrun. And during overrun, the Germans can advance one area and conduct combat. And there's rubble in uh, the area they're moving to. They can attempt to clear rubble also. Now, it is at this point in the combat sequence that the Soviets, if they have a hero marker available, can use it to cancel the overrun. And the Soviets do have their hero marker available. The hero marker's function is to cancel one overrun. The downside is that they can only cancel one such overrun per turn. And we're in impulse one of turn one, so it is very early in turn one. Do the Soviets want to burn that hero marker right now? In an overrun attack, the German units could cross this uh, ravine here. And you see it doesn't have any of these bridge symbols. So only infantry and pioneer units could cross the ravine. And they could move into Area 21 and then have further combat against this NKVD regiment. Or move into Area 27 and again have combat against that other NKVD regiment, or they could move into the vacant Area 28 Stalingradsky airfield and stop there. And why is that area so important? Because it is adjacent to Mamayev Kurgan. Mamayev Kurgan is essential to uh, interdict Volga crossings, make Volga crossings more costly for the Soviets. So the Germans have a chance to move in to move to an area adjacent to Mamayev Kurgan. And the Soviets decide to use the hero marker to cancel such an overrun. And we flip the marker to its used side. And we place these eliminated Soviet independent units in their corresponding box in the Soviet reinforcement card. Only independent units that are eliminated can return to the game. Independent units are those that have white coloring inside their NATO symbol, as shown in those two infantry units. And for panzer or armored units, the white coloring behind the tank silhouette. So there's no overrun, and the German infantry and pioneer units will remain in Area 20 for now. So now we return the Soviet artillery support marker to the Soviet support marker box, and we place it there with its used side showing. We return the German air support marker to the German support marker box, also with its used side showing. 
and we place the uh, artillery support marker for the 71st Infantry Division on space number one of the impulse track also with its used side showing. It is not available for use again until turn two. So that concludes the activation of the units that were originally in area 18 and the Germans can activate one more area or zone where they have units. The Germans will activate area number 40 that's the Razgul Yayevka station. They have four units of the German 295th Infantry Division. And they will move three of those units into the Tartar Wall area, Area 30. And that will create a mandatory combat situation against the uh, regiment there of the uh, NKVD 10th Division. We see the lead unit selected. The Soviets don't have a choice. They only have one unit. And now, any available artillery, artillery can be added to the attack. The Germans decide not to add the support, artillery support marker of the 295th Division, which is available for use. They will save it for later use during the turn. So do the Soviets want to use their artillery support marker, the one they have remaining now and they will also save it for later so now the Germans can use their unused air support marker which they will bring into the combat and now we roll to determine how many combat factors that air support marker will contribute to this combat situation and it's four once again so that's not bad so now we calculate the total attack value for the Germans, 4 for the lead unit, plus 1 for each additional unit. We're at 6. There is divisional integrity. We're at 7. And plus 4 for the air support, 11 for the Germans. And the Soviet total defense, 3 for the lead defensive unit, plus 1 for the terrain effects modifier for a total of 4. So it's 11 to 4 in favor of the Germans for now. So let's roll 2d6s and add the corresponding totals to each side. The Germans rolled a 3, the Soviets 11. So the total attack for the Germans is 14 and for the Soviets is 15. So this is a repulse because the uh, defender's total is greater than the attacker's total. In a repulse, all participating attacking units are reduced. Unless the attackers, in this case the Germans, have the advantage marker, and they do so, and they declare a maximum attack, and that converts a repulse into a stalemate. In a stalemate, each of the lead units is reduced with no further effects. Germans can't afford reducing three units at once, so they will use the advantage marker. And it is now possessed by the Soviets. The advantage marker during the maneuvers phase can be used once per impulse, and we're in impulse one. So the result of the combat after use of the advantage marker is a stalemate, and we reduce each of the lead units. And the support marker is placed in the German support marker's box, used side up. And that's the end of the German first impulse with mixed results. A disaster in the Tartar Wall that was mitigated only because the Germans had the advantage. They don't have the advantage now. Another fiasco like that. And they will have to reduce all the attacking units. And uh, the Soviet had, had to burn their hero marker to prevent an advance and overrun into Stalingradsky airfield. So now we move to Impulse 2. And note that in Impulses 1 and 2, it is impossible for the Germans uh, to roll a logistical dice roll less than the current Impulse. So we didn't even mention that. But beginning in Impulse 3, it is possible, and it becomes more likely as the Impulse Marker advances. So now we go 
to impulse two, Soviets go now, and it's the Soviets' impulse. So now the Soviets have to choose between a Soviet assault impulse or a non-assault impulse. And uh, the Soviets have some holes to plug, Stalingradsky airfield, Mamayev Kurgan, so they probably have to move units from more than one area. And the downside for them is that this is a day impulse, so they can only activate units from one area or zone. It is only during night impulses that they can activate units from one area plus units from either zone L or M. So uh, the Soviets will choose the regroup uh, action, which is a non-assault impulse. And with regroup, the Soviets can activate every friendly unit on the map and move them one area. The uh, limitation is they cannot move any of their units into areas occupied by German units. So the Soviets start by regrouping these two worker units into these two areas respectively. Stalingradsky needs to be uh, occupied by some Soviet units. So these two units, the one in area 32 and area 31 will regroup there. Now area 31 is empty, but the Soviets have some units nearby. Soviets will move these two tank units into area 31. And the tank unit in area 45 will move to area 38. Now we keep on moving to what is the northern part of the city, that worker unit in area 58 to the sports park. Area 64 is unoccupied and adjacent to a German area, which is 65. So the Germans will move this infantry regiment there. And the Soviets have some units here in the southern parts of the city adjacent to various German divisions that are intact. So those units will not be regrouping for now. And we see the situation near the uh, German units that have occupied area 20. So that's the end of this regroup move by the Soviets, and that's the end of the Soviet first, or I should say second impulse. So now we move on to German impulse number two. And the Germans will conduct an assault impulse. So we start with movement, any attempt then to clear rubble, and then combat resolution. And the Germans have combined operations. They can activate two areas. They will start by activating the units that they have in zone F. And after that, they will see how these units fare and will activate another area or zone. So this is a sequential activation. All four units that are in zone F will now move into Area 41, the farm, defended by a sole Soviet infantry regiment. So lead, attack, and defense units are assigned. And now we'll check for artillery support. The Germans have available the um, divisional artillery for the 389th Infantry Division. Do they want to use it now? may not be necessary, may be overkill. But we saw how the last attack fared with the terrible uh, dice rolling by the Germans. Well, two lightning bolts can't fall in the same place, so they will not use the artillery support markers and they will save it for later. The Soviets have one artillery support marker left and they will also not use that one for now. Now the Germans will use one of their air support markers. Remember that the air support markers 
two of them in total are available for the Germans on each impulse. So the Germans have four for the lead unit, three more units, so that's seven, divisional integrity, eight, and now we roll for the air support unit to see how much it provides. And another four is rolled, so the total attack value for the Germans is 12. The Soviet defense value is 2 for the lone unit, plus 1 for the terrain effects modifier, that is 3. So 12 to 3, we roll 2d6s on each side, and both sides rolled an 8, so the Germans have 20, the Russians 11. So it's a success, this attack for the Germans, and the Russians have to absorb 9 attrition points, which of course they don't have. The defending unit is eliminated, and this unit is not an independent unit. It is permanently eliminated from the game, cannot return. And we also remove the Soviet control marker. And we have an overrun, and the Soviets have already expended their hero marker. So these units will be moving to another adjacent area. But first, we have to reduce the German lead unit. The Germans have some choices. They could move here to the Triangle Woods, or they could move here to Hill 109.4, where uh, the Soviets don't have as much strength in units and terrain effects modifiers. And the Germans move into the Triangle Woods. And notice that now the air support marker that participated in the original attack also is available. In this one. So we declare the lead units. And now artillery support. The Germans still have available the uh, artillery support marker for the 389th Infantry Division. Do they want to use it in this combat situation? And they will use it, and now the Soviets have to decide if they will use their remaining support marker for the 62nd Army. Soviets decide not to use it, so now the total attack value for the Germans is 4 plus 2 additional units. That's 6, and the division integrity bonus applies because there's 2 units from the same division, but... They also have the artillery support marker. So we're at seven, and now we roll for the air support. Air support is only two, so we're at nine, plus the artillery support, which is always two in the attack. So the Germans have a total offense value of 11. Soviet defense value is three for the unit, plus two for the terrain, five. So it's 11 to 5, and we roll 2d6s on each side. And the Germans roll a 2, the Soviets roll an 8. So the Germans have 13, and the Soviets also have 13. This is a stalemate. And in a stalemate, both lead units are reduced. And we remove the uh, support markers, and that's it. That's a contested area now. So the Germans fail in clearing the Triangle Woods and almost suffer a, uh, what is called, a repulse. Here we have the situation. Mamayev Kurgan is not occupied by any Soviet unit. Stalingradsky airfield has a defense of five right now. And the Germans have a shot at reaching Mamayev Kurgan this turn if they obtain an overrun. So they will activate the units in Area 20. And uh, all but one of those units spend four movement factors, then they enter Stalingradsky Airfield, and we will have a combat situation there. Mandatory attack. Here we see the lead attacking and defending units. And now for artillery support, the uh, Germans have already used the 71st Division's artillery. The Soviets will use their artillery support marker, the last one for the 62nd Army. So 
So it is placed in the area. The Germans now will bring the second air support marker. And now we calculate the offensive value of the Germans. Four plus two additional units, six plus divisional integrity, seven. And now we roll for air support. And the worst that can happen, happen. Plus only one, eight. The Soviet uh, defense value is two plus an additional unit, three plus the terrain effects modifier, four, and plus the uh, artillery support, one, that's five. So we're at eight, the Germans, five for the Soviets. Now we roll two D6s for each side. And luckily for the Germans, they roll an eight. So they have 16, the Russians roll a five, so they have 10. So the difference is six attrition points. This is a success for the Germans. So the Soviets eliminate their lead defense unit that absorbs three attrition points. They have to absorb two more. They reduce the uh, other Soviet unit that absorbs a fourth attrition point. And now they retreat that Soviet unit and we have to follow the retreat priorities and the retreat will absorb the fifth attrition point meaning there won't be any overrun here we see the retreat priorities first a free area adjacent to the least number of enemy controlled areas if not a friendly controlled contested area if not an enemy controlled contested area and if not a fully stacked area uh, when we say a free area that means an area that is vacant and under friendly control and Mamayev Kurgan uh, complies with such criteria so Soviet surviving unit retreats there and we uh, clear the map or the area of the support markers and we reduce the German lead unit also so the Germans at least manage to uh, move adjacent to Mamayev Kurgan and their 71st division is pretty depleted only has two full strength units but one is that uh, pioneer battalion and the other regiment is in area 20. and that's the end of the german second impulse now we move on to the third impulse so we place the impulse marker in box three and now we conduct a soviet impulse and we see now various contested areas, for example, the Triangle Woods, and uh, we also have the Tartar Wall is a contested area. And uh, units can move, for example, the Germans could move out of a contested area, but only into a free area, an area that is vacant. So the Soviets don't want, for example, the Germans moving a unit from the Triangle Woods into the Barricade Workers Settlement so uh, they probably want to move units there so the situation looks tempting maybe in some places for a counterattack, but uh, it would leave so many other places exposed that the soviets will again choose a non-assault impulse and again another regroup action so the Soviets will uh, regroup this worker unit into the Barricadi worker settlement. And this other worker unit into Hill 107.5. Now the Soviet 5-5 tank unit will move here to area 32nd, the Ovrash Naya Woods. Soviets still want to plug some gaps. The uh, NKVD regiment here in the uh, flight school settlement will regroup to area 26. And the other NKVD regiment that is in area 21 will regroup to the flight school settlement. Now this uh, Tank regiment in the uh, Dub 
Dubovaya Woods will regroup to Area 21. This infantry regiment will regroup to the cemetery. And this NKVD regiment to train station number two. And that concludes the regrouping by the Soviet forces. They still hold a pretty strong perimeter here in the southern parts of the city. Remember that the left side of your screen is the south. So now we move on to the German third impulse. Now the Germans will begin with the units that they have in the south of the city and they will activate area number two. And all the units in area number two move into area number three. That's Kuprosnoye, that's an urban area. Now we have combat there. Of course, this is a German assault impulse lead unit. One of the German infantry regiments and the Soviets have the infantry regiment also as lead unit. The Germans will also use their artillery support marker for the 29th uh, infantry division. And now they will also allocate one of their air support markers. Soviets, of course, have no artillery available. Now we roll to see the strength of the air support. And it's a three, so it could have been worse. Let's see what the attack value is. Five plus three additional units, that's eight, plus divisional integrity, nine, plus the artillery, 11, plus three, 14. Soviet uh, defense value is 2 plus an additional unit, 3 plus the terrain effects modifier, 6, 14 to 6. Now we roll 2d6 for each of the sides, 8 for the Germans, 7 for the Soviets. So the Germans end up with 22 and the Soviets 13, that's 9 attrition points, a success for the Germans. So both Soviet units are eliminated, and that only absorbs six attrition points. And we have to reduce the German lead unit. And we remove the Soviet control marker. Now we have an overrun. And overrunning units can move to one adjacent unit, and they don't... And overrunning units move to one adjacent area, and they all don't have to move to the same area. And one thing, notice that the dice roll of the Germans and 8 uh, plus the terrain effects modifier of this urban space plus 3 is 11. If that die roll, that combination, the dice roll plus the terrain effects modifier is 13 or more, rubble would have been created there, but not in this case. So we see here that the uh, lead unit moved into the 25th of October lumber mill, so we remove that Soviet control marker. The rest of the units moved into the Minina workers settlement. So now we have another mandatory combat situation and the Germans can use of course their two support markers, the air marker and artillery marker uh, that participated in the original attack. So both sides designate their lead units and artillery wise the Germans again used their support marker for the 29th uh, Division. And now the Soviets don't have any artillery available as to air support. The Germans again used their air support marker. And we roll for the strength of the air support. And this time it's a six, so they mean business. So let's calculate the attack value. Five plus two more units, seven, there's divisional integrity, eight, artillery support, 10, plus six for the air support, 16. Soviet uh, defense value is three, plus an additional unit, four, plus the terrain 
effects modifier 7. So it's 16 to 7 and we roll 2d6s for each side. And the roll is a 9 for the Germans, 8 for the Soviets. So the total attack is 25 for the Germans and 15 for the Soviets. That is a German success and 10 attrition points need to be absorbed by the Soviets. But of course the Soviets don't have 10 attrition points so both units are eliminated. And we reduce the lead German unit. The Germans now have control of the area. Now we clear the support markers from the area. And the Germans can activate one additional area. Germans will activate Zone E, where they have uh, independent units, independent infantry and panzer unit. So both units will move into Zone 18. That costs two movement points. And the uh, panzer unit will continue into Zone 20. That's two more movement factors. It has two left. And it will move into Stalingradsky Airfield for the final sixth movement point. So that was the second area, or in this case a zone activated. So that's the end of the German third impulse. Now we move to the fourth impulse, and now the Soviets decide if it'll be an assault or a non-assault impulse. See, these last attacks have left some vacant areas adjacent to German areas. Uh, we have that situation here in the food combine. Also, we have uh, Mamayev Kurgan is exposed to uh, an attack. Uh, in a future in the next German impulse. So it seems that the Soviet will, Soviets will have to take another regroup action just to s continue to try to strengthen the areas that are adjacent to German areas. So the Soviets will take a regroup action and they will regroup this NKVD unit here into the food combine. Next, they will regroup two of these infantry units here into train station number two. The Soviets are almost giving up uh, the leather factory. And the Soviets are holding areas, many with just one unit. So there's not much to uh, regroup around the area that we're looking at, the red barracks, is empty, and Mamayev Kurgan, of course, is in grave danger. So the Soviets will regroup this strong armored regiment into Mamayev Kurgan. And the workers' unit and this tank regiment to Area 32. And taking a look here at Area 29, the tank regiment there will move, regroup to Area 31, and the infantry unit in 19 will go to Area 29. That leaves Area 19 empty, but Soviets don't have much choice in terms of uh, trying to plug the gaps. This uh, regiment here in Hill 109.4 moves to the Machetka Woods. And this independent infantry uh, brigade moves to Hill 109.4. 
Here we see the situation in the northern part of the board. It's been pretty stagnant. And the Soviets still hold the line there. Finally, this workers' unit moves into Area 50. So there's many weak spots yet for the Soviets, but there's not many units to plug the gaps, and this ends this Soviet impulse. As to losses so far, the Soviets have lost three independent units, but those may return. But as to permanent losses, the Soviets have lost five units shown here. And now it's the Germans' fourth impulse. The Germans could conceivably try to uh, take uh, Mamayev Kurgan, but that's a very risky proposition. The defense in Mamayev Kurgan is currently nine, so they can forget about that for now. Germans will uh, activate this time two areas at the same time. We had activated before in prior impulses sequentially. The Germans will activate their units in area 8 and area 16. And all these units are units of the 24th Panzer Division. So they can move... Uh, at the same time and attack at the same time. So as to movement, we will see these two units who they cannot cross this ravine because they're armored units spend two movement points to move to area eight and spend four movement points to enter the Saritsa woods. And now these two units in area eight also enter the Saritsa woods. And we have a mandatory combat situation. We pick the lead units. Now for artillery support, the Germans will use the support marker for the 24th Panzer Division. And air support, they will also use one of their two air support markers. Now we roll for air support strength. The roll is a six. That is nasty. And now we calculate the Germans' attack value. Six plus three units, nine divisional integrity, ten artillery support, twelve plus air support, eighteen. The Soviets have a two plus an additional unit, three, and two for the Saritsa Woods terrain effects modifier, five. 18 to 5. There's no way the Germans are going to lose this fight. Now we roll 2d6s for each of the sides. 7 for the Germans, 10 for the Soviets. So the total attack for the Germans is 25 and the Soviets 15. So this is another German success and there's going to be another overrun. And note that the dice roll of 7 uh, doubles as the logistical dice roll. The uh, seven is not less than the current impulse number four, so daylight continues. So the Soviets have to absorb 10 attrition points. They have to eliminate both of their units, and that will not cover it. Only six attrition points are absorbed. We have to reduce the lead attacking German unit. And now we have an overrun. So where will the German units move into? And we will see units of the 24th Panzer Division moving into the cemetery. And this creates another mandatory combat situation. So we designate lead units. As to artillery, the Germans can use the artillery unit that participated in the original attack. Soviets have no available artillery air support. They can also, the Germans, use the same air support unit. And let's uh, roll a die to see what the strength of the air support is. 
and this time it's a three. Let's calculate the uh, German attack value. Six plus two units, eight. There's divisional integrity, nine. Artillery support is two. Eleven plus three for the air support, 14. The Soviet defensive value is two for the lead and sole unit there. Three for the uh, terrain effects modifier, five plus one because there's rubble for six so it's 14 to six in favor of the germans it's looking good for them we roll two d6s for each side three for the germans five for the soviets note that if this would have been the first combat situation in this impulse for the germans that dice roll of three would have been the german logistical dice roll and that would change day into nighttime but fortunately for the germans this is not the logistical uh, dice roll. So the Germans have a total of 17 and the Soviets 11. So the Germans have a success and the Soviets have to absorb five attrition points. And that eliminates the uh, sole defending unit and the Germans have to reduce their lead attacking unit. We clear the support markers and the Soviet control marker so the Germans now control also the cemetery. And the cemetery is an urban area near to, adjacent to the Volga station, the dock. So the Germans uh, are already in control of one victory point area here, the 25th of October lumber mill, and uh, in proximity of two two victory point areas. And that's the end of the German fourth impulse. Remember that we had activated two areas in order to move all the units of the 24th Panzer together. So now this is a situation at the end of the fourth impulse and we're moving now into impulse number five so we move the marker to impulse number five it's soviet impulse and note that the germans have used four of their uh, divisional artillery markers and the uh, situation is that the germans now have advanced into the cemetery and they are adjacent to various victory point areas which are empty like we stated the volga station as well as other urban areas like the radio station here we see tr the train station so uh, there's only one way to fill those uh, areas and it it's with another regroup action if uh if the Soviets take an assault impulse, they can only activate one area, and the Soviets have uh, uh, only uh, a couple of areas where they have two units. So this is going to be another non-assault impulse for the Soviets, and they will take the regroup action. So the NKVD regiment here in the food combine regroups to the Volga station. Both Soviet uh, infantry regiments in the train station regroup to the food combine. And the Soviet unit here in the leather factory regroups to the train station. Soviets still have to fill some empty areas near the river bank. So we see here that the uh, tank regiment here in Hill 112.5 will regroup to the radio station. Soviets don't want to give up the uh, Dubraya wood, so this NKVD unit will regroup to Area 21. And the NKVD regiment here will regroup to the flight school settlement. The reduced independent infantry unit will regroup here to uh, Area 26.
because of the pressing situation that uh, will happen in next uh, German Impulse, where they will be able to freely enter the train station, and who knows if this uh, area also, the 9th January Square, the strong armored unit here in Mamayev Kurgan will have to regroup here to the oil refinery. And the Soviets will regroup these two units here in the Ovarashnaya woods into Mamayev Kurgan. And this tank regiment into the Ovarashnaya woods. This uh, almost isolated Soviet unit in Hill 126.3 will move here to Area 31. See the situation in the northern area of the map. No German attacks from this sector yet. So the line is holding there, but the situation in the south is becoming one of an emergency. See uh, Rodim Steb's 13 uh, Guard Division in zone M, but they cannot cross until nighttime. So we're in impulse number five, and that's the end of the Soviet regroup action. Now we go to German impulse number five. So the Germans have the 24th Panzer Division with half of their units already under strength. If they attack with the other two, they will have all their units under strength. But there's gaps that the Germans can take advantage of and practically occupy two areas without having to fight for them. So the Germans will activate Area 14. And now it's time to move. And you would probably think that the Germans would have enough movement points to move into the train station and then in one move into the 9th January Square. Well, they do have enough movement points, but the problem is that rubble has the nasty effect of stopping your move. So once they enter the train station, they have to stop there. Here we see the terrain effects chart and uh, movement. All units must stop upon entry of in rubbled areas. The Germans could, in theory, move one unit here and it would have to stop and remaining two units here and attack the NKVD regiment. There, that is a pretty risky proposition because the Germans uh, would have one under strength unit most probably here, and if they lose that attack, they will lose that unit. Soviet defense here is pretty strong. It is seven. Rubble adds one to the defense. But on the other hand, we're in impulse five. Uh, we may not have many more daylight impulses. And is it worth it to uh, reduce one more unit to take control of the Volga station the docks that's two victory points another consideration the germans would have to include these three units in this attack to get the divisional integrity bonus so they would be risking this reduced unit so they will do it they move all three units into the volga station and that's a mandatory combat situation so now we designate lead units now we uh, include any support markers the Germans have used up for the turn, their artillery support. Soviets have no artillery support, but the Germans have one, actually two, uh, air support markers, and they can use one right here. Now we roll to determine the strength of the air support, and it's a five, so the Attack value for the Germans is 7 plus 2 units, 
9 plus divisional integrity, 10 plus the air support, 15. The Soviet defensive value is 3 for the lead unit, 3 for the terrain effects modifier, 6 plus 1 for the rubble, 7. So it's 15 to 7 in favor of the Germans. Now we roll 2d6s for each side. Germans roll an 11, the Soviets a 6, so the Germans have 26, and the Soviets 13, it's a success, and the Soviets have to absorb 13 casualty or attrition points, which they don't have. So the NKVD unit is eliminated, now we reduce the lead attacking unit, and we clear the support marker and Soviet control marker, so the Germans have reached the Volga station and uh, they cannot conduct an overrun because again another effect of rubble is that overruns are not allowed from areas that have rubble so that takes care of uh, that attack the Germans can activate one more area. Notice that the cemetery is empty and uh, the Germans want to fill that area. So they will activate the Panzer Regiment in Zone D and it will move Area 8 that spends one movement point and into Area 9 which is adjacent to an enemy unit that spends two additional movement points, so it has three left, and moves into the cemetery, spending a fifth movement point, and it cannot move any further. That is the end of the fifth German impulse. We are still in the daylight. So now we move on to the sixth impulse. We're still in daylight. And it's the Soviet impulse. And after taking a look at uh, the Germans' success in reaching a second riverbank area, we see that there is another riverbank area which is devoid of any units. So the Soviets have to keep on regrouping. Otherwise, uh, they will give up a lot of victory points in the next German impulse. So, regroup action is taken again, another uh, non-assault impulse. The strong uh, Russian uh, tank unit enters the 9th January Square. Of course, that will make the Germans think, it, think about it twice to attack there. Now, this uh, Soviet tank unit goes to train station number one. The NKVD unit here in Hill 112.5 goes to the radio station. And the Soviets regroup out of the Dubovaya woods, this infantry unit, into Area 21. Now this uh, weak independent infantry unit to the Red Barracks this tank unit goes to Area 26. And meanwhile, we reinforce Mamayev Kurgan with this tank regiment also. This unit will regroup into the Ovarashnaya woods. And this unit, which is in a contested area, can regroup to an to a free area here, so it will do so. And I just noted this this area didn't have a Soviet control marker. It should have had, but now that this unit has regrouped out of it, we remove the Soviet control marker. This Worker unit joins the other worker unit here at the Barricadi Workers Settlement. This infantry unit here will regroup to Mechetka 
ravine. Soviets are trying to bring more uh, units here to the uh, south of the city, but uh, there's not a lot of places from where to pull units. And uh, that's the situation after this additional or further regrouping action. Germans are feeling the effects of the attrition for the 24th Panzer. Only has one full strength unit, but that's the uh, Pioneer Battalion. Now we go to the German 6th Impulse. So the Germans have an opportunity to try to take Mamayev Kurgan by activating uh, Area 28. We're in Impulse 6, so there's a big chance that um, nighttime will be the next impulse, and then we will see during night the crossing of the Volga of Rodimstev's 13th uh, Guard Rifle Division, and these guys are tough, so the Germans have to really give serious consideration to uh, trying to take Mamayev Kurgan now, and the lead unit would be that independent tank regiment. So maybe a better opportunity to take Mamayev Kurgan will not present itself. Now notice that the fresh uh, infantry regiment of the 71st can't make it into Mamayev Kurgan because there will be two movement points here spend it because it's adjacent to an enemy unit plus four is six so we would have to use these four units to attack Mamayev Kurgan and in the unlikely or unfortunate event of an, a repulse the Germans would lose two of their infantry regiments and uh, another alternative is to take a regroup action for the Germans and start uh, moving some of our of uh, the Germans units that are separated we can see several units there but in any regroup action the Germans would not be able to enter Soviet control areas so they wouldn't be able to take control of the leather factory or Dubovaya woods they would still remain in Soviet hands so the Germans will take another assault impulse and they will activate first area 28 and then uh, we'll see how that goes and activate a second area. So all four units move into Mamayev Kurgan and we have a mandatory attack there. Artillery support, well the, uh, the German 71st Artil uh, Infantry Division already used its artillery support marker and the Soviets already have theirs used so we move now to air support and the Germans allocate one of their air support markers now we roll to see the strength of the air support this is very important and it is five so the Germans are doing well so far now we calculate the attack value Lead unit is 5, plus 3 units, 8, plus divisional integrity, 9, plus 5 for the air support, 14. The Soviet defense value, 3 for the lead unit, plus 1 for an additional unit is 4, plus 3 for the terrain effects modifier is 7. So it's 14 for the Germans, 7 for the Soviets, and we rolled 2d6s on both sides. Germans roll a 6. Soviets roll a 7. So the German total attack is 20 and the Soviets 14. So that is a success for the Germans and the Soviets have to remove or absorb 6 attrition points. And the Soviets having the advantage marker, they may declare a fanatical defense to turn this German success into a stalemate. 
And uh, of course, that would give the advantage marker back to the Germans. So, if that happens, Mamayev Kurgan would be contested instead of controlled by the Germans. And there's a difference as to both statuses. The Germans having control of Mamayev Kurgan gives a plus two die roll modifier on the Soviet Volga crossing table. If they contest it, it's just plus one. So the Soviets will use the advantage and declare fanatical defense. So the advantage marker now passes to the Germans. And notice that that German dice roll was the first one in the impulse that serves as the logistical dice roll. And it is six, which is equal to the impulse number where we are. And in normal circumstances, that would cause a logistical pause. But because of this turn one special rule, there is no logistical pause in game turn number one. So the result of the battle for Mamayev Kurgan is a stalemate, and we reduce both lead units. So the area is still under Soviet control, but it is now a contested area. Germans can activate one more area, but the situation here right now is that Stalingradsky airfield is vacant and the Germans could be surrounded in Mamayev Kurgan and uh, that would prompt a surrender dice roll and they don't want any of that so the Germans will activate the uh, independent panzer uh, regiment in Gumrak Road and it will move sending two movement points to area 20 and two more movement points to reach area 28 and that's the end of the German sixth impulse. So at the end of the German sixth impulse the Germans have uh, occupied two victory point areas for a total of four victory points. They can trace supply to the uh, zones that are either D, E, F or G. They have caused substantial losses of Soviet units as we will see but many of their units are reduced and uh, probably not susceptible to further attacks during this turn but we still have uh, some impulses to go we're about to begin impulse number seven Situation on this sector of the map has been pretty stagnant for the last couple of impulses. Soviets have closed the gaps, but they don't have much in terms of reserves. Cannot bring any units across the Volga yet in daytime. The Germans have the advantage, which also means that uh, in the event of a logistical dice roll that changes day into night, they can use it to prolong daylight. So that's another consideration in their favor. We're about to start impulse seven, so it is very likely that very soon uh, the impulses will change from daylight to nighttime. And there are two circumstances in the game where the advantage marker changes possession involuntarily and one is when that happens if uh, the impulses change from daylight to nighttime and at that time the Germans have possession of the advantage marker then it is given to the Soviets and the other circumstance is if uh, in the last phase of the game the end phase if the Soviets have the advantage marker at that time, then the possession of the advantage marker changes again to the Germans. So, in essence, every time that night impulses will start, the Soviets will have the advantage. And every time that a new turn starts, the Germans will have the advantage. So, with that caveat in mind, we now move to impulse seven and we're still in daylight 
and it's the Soviet's impulse. So the Soviets have to choose again between a non-assault impulse or an assault impulse. They may regroup again, but right now they have their units in place. There's no gaps in the line. Uh, so the regrouping would not be uh, as dramatic as in other impulses. Now, in a Soviet assault impulse, in addition to being able to attack German forces, uh, the Soviets can also attempt to build fortifications. And when we see the situation here, uh, uh, Germans have uh, occupied two riverbank areas worth victory points, 25th of October Lumber Mill and the Volga Station. And the Soviets, if they take an assault impulse, they could attack one of those areas, but you see the Soviets don't have uh, enough strength. In the food combine, they have uh, units with attack factors of two, so uh, it would be a risky proposition. If they attack, for example, the lumber mill, they could end up uh, weakening their own forces and then the Germans sweeping them up in the next impulse. And the Soviets have here in the 9th of January Square a strong armored unit, but it's just one unit, so it's another risky proposition to have it attack the food combine. So um, the, German, the Soviets have to choose between another regroup action, which will not be as dramatic as before, or taking an impulse, a Soviet assault impulse, just to attempt to construct fortifications either in the food combine or in the 9th uh, January square. So the Soviets will conduct an assault impulse. And notice that this is daytime. They can only activate one area. And uh, they start by attempting to build fortifications and then they can move and resolve any combat. But most likely we won't see any movement or combat. So the question is, where will the Soviets attempt to build a fortification? There's uh, two riverbank areas which the Germans can threaten in the next impulse, and that's the food combine and the 9th January Square. The strength of the defense in the 9th January Square is 5 for the Soviet unit, plus 1 for rubble is 6, plus 3 for the terrain is 9. And the strength in the food combine is uh, 2 for one of the units, plus 1 for the other units, 3 plus 4 for the food combines, terrain effects modifier 7, plus rubble 8. So the food combine is the weaker of the two defensively, and that's the area that will be activated. And here we see the Soviet fortification creation table. Uh, one die roll must be rolled, and on a 4 or more, the attempt succeeds. And there's a plus 1 die roll modifier because the area... In this case, the food combine is an urban area. So we roll 1d6 with a plus 1 die roll modifier. We need 4 or more. The roll is a 4 modified to a 5, and the Soviets successfully construct fortifications in the food combine, increasing its defensive strength now to 9. And that's the end of the Soviet 7th impulse. Now to the German 7th impulse. So, do the Germans have one more attack in them? In Mamayev Kurgan, they only have one full strength unit, which is that Pioneer Battalion. It is a fully stacked German area, so that means that the Germans could not be uh, bring uh, Camp Group 6 unless they take one of those uh, German units out of there. So, another possibility is activating both areas 28 and 33 moving one of those uh, uh, reduced units into Stalingradsky airfield and bringing in that powerful panzer uh, regiment and attack Mamayev Kurgan. The Germans could also activate the 94th Infantry Division, which has been just uh, looking at the action for now, and they could move, occupy the leather factory and, and attack the train station. 
And because the Germans have the advantage, if the logistical dice roll is less than seven, uh, which would change day into nighttime, they can use the advantage to prolong daylight. But in that event, if that happens, the advantage would shift to the Soviets. So a uh, subsequent logistical die roll less than the current impulse would change definitely uh, day into night. So, because the Germans have the advantage, the best attack to make right now is that of Mamayev Kurgan. Why? Because in the unfortunate event of a repulse, which causes all reduced units to be eliminated, the advantage marker can be used to cancel the repulse and, and uh, convert it into a stalemate. So the Germans, what they will be doing is activating in a combined operation Area 33, and area 28 and the first uh, matter is movement and the Germans will move this uh, armored regiment from Mamayev Kurgan to Stalingradsky airfield now the Germans move this uh, five strength uh, panzer regiment into Mamayev Kurgan and now we proceed to resolve combat in Mamayev Kurgan, designating the lead units. As to artillery support markers, the Germans don't have any available uh, that could participate in this combat, and neither do the Soviets. The Germans now do allocate one of their air support markers. And we roll 1d6 to determine its strength. A 1, so this uh, is not going well. So the German uh, offense value is 5 for the lead unit, plus 3 for each one of the other units there, 8, plus 1 for divisional integrity, 9, plus 1 for the air support, 10. Soviet defense is 2 for the lead unit, plus an additional unit is 3, plus the terrain effects modifier of 3 is a total of 6. So it's 10 to 6 in favor of the Germans. We roll two d6s on each side. 8 for the Germans, 3 for the Soviets. And notice that that dice roll of 8 doubles as the logistical dice roll. And we compare it to the current impulse number 7. So because the logistical dice roll is not less than the current impulse, there is no change to nighttime yet. So the next impulse will be a daylight impulse. Turning to our example here, the Germans have an attack total of 18 and the Soviets a defense total of 9. So this is a German success and 9 attrition points have to be absorbed by the Soviet units. And both Soviet units are eliminated. And that absorbs only 6 of the 9 attrition points. So we have an overrun. But before we have to reduce the German lead attacking unit. And the Germans could advance either into the oil refinery or the Lasur chemical factory. Each one of these areas is worth one victory point. The Panzer Kamp Group will conduct overrun movement into the Soviet oil refinery. And the Germans will move one of their reduced infantry regiments of the 71st Division into the Lasur chemical factory. And we see the Germans have captured two uh, victory point areas, each worth one victory point. So now they control uh, four Volga riverbank areas for a total of five victory points. That's the end of the seventh impulse. Now to Soviet impulse number eight. And we see the Soviets have a big problem in their hands. The Germans have uh, reached the Volga, although not in force with weakened units here. But the Soviets don't have enough forces, local forces, to drive them back. So uh, this looks like it's going to be another regroup impulse for the Soviets to try to uh, prevent the Germans from occupying more riverbank areas and 
There seems no way any Soviet unit can reach the Red October Steelworks uh, with a regroup move. Soviets need to get a unit here into the Red October Steelworks. It's two victory points. And uh, there's no adjacent Soviet unit, so a regroup action will not uh, do the trick. So the Soviets will conduct a redeploy move, activating one unit in an area and moving it an unlimited number of areas. So the Soviets will move one of their two uh, infantry units in Orlovka through friendly controlled Soviet areas, as you see here, so that it reaches the Red October steelworks and now you see that the Germans at least will have to fight for it and they don't have a uh, strength to do that uh, they could move into the Red October's work settlement but that's not a riverbank area so it's uh, the lesser of two evils on to the German 8th impulse See, the Germans have uh, succeeded in reaching various Volga riverbank areas, but uh, some of their units have uh, spread out. You see there, the 24th Panzer has one of its regiments in the Saritsa woods, and the rest of the division is in the Volga station. And uh, the same thing happens with the 71st Infantry Division, we have uh, units in the Lazur Chemical Factory, Mamayev Kurgan, and there is one full strength regiment still in uh, area number 20, uh, via Gorodok. So uh, the Germans can benefit too from a uh, regroup action, which allows them to move every single unit one area, and that's what they will do even though it's still a daylight impulse. But the Germans can also regroup at night, so uh, by performing a regroup action here, we waste another opportunity of using uh, the Germans' air support. The Germans have yet to use the artillery of the 295th Infantry Division, which is mostly concentrated in the uh, Tartar Wall, Area 30. So, the Germans will activate Area 30 and 40 in a combined operation. And the units in the Tartar Wall move into Area 31, and the German unit, which is at uh, Area 40, moves into Area 30. It doesn't have enough movement points to get to 31. So we have a mandatory combat situation in Area 31, and this time the Germans will designate the Engineer Battalion as lead unit. So the uh, artillery support marker for the division now will be used as well as one of the air support markers. And we roll for the strength of the air support. So the attack value is 2 plus two additional units, four, divisional integrity, five, artillery support, seven, plus three for air support is 10. Soviet uh, defensive value is one for the unit and two for the terrain effects modifier, three. So it's 10 to three. And we roll two D6s for each side. 12 for the Germans. That's also the logistical dice roll and it is not less than the impulse number so impulse 9 will also be daylight so the Germans have a total of 22 and the Soviets 8 so it's a German success with 14 attrition points that wipes out the Soviet unit and we have to reduce the lead pioneer battalion now we have an overrun and the Red October worker settlement seems uh, ripe for the taking and it is occupied 
by two units, including the full strength uh, infantry regiment, and one unit is left in Area 31. And that takes care of the German 8th Impulse. Still daylight, and yeah, Impulse 9 will also be a daylight impulse. And here we see the situation in the southern part of the city. So now we proceed to Soviet Impulse number 9. Soviets have the same problem now. They have uh, no units near the Barricade Ordnance Factory, which is worth two victory points. The Germans have two units at the Red October's Workers' Settlement. So conceivably they could move and take Area 47. So the Soviets again will conduct a redeploy action, activating one unit in an area and moving it an unlimited number of areas so that it reaches the Barricade Ordnance Factory. So the Soviets need to get a unit here to the Barricade Ordnance Factory and it will be this four strength unit here in Hill 109.4. It will move across Soviet controlled areas and reach the Barricade Ordnance Factory. And that consumes the Soviet ninth impulse. And this is the situation. Now on to the German ninth impulse. And the Germans will now activate the 94th Infantry Division in a combined operation activating areas 7 and 6. And uh, the Germans will move the units from both areas into the leather factory. And that concludes the movement because uh, that spends two movement points. They don't have enough to enter the train station. Now we have to make a logistical dice roll to see if uh, daylight changes. So we roll 2d6 and 7, which is less than the impulse number of 9. So it changes unless the Germans use the advantage to prolong daylight. And they will do so. So now we flip the advantage marker to the Soviet side. The Germans want to extend daylight so that in impulse number 10 they can activate the 94th Infantry Division, and they can attack into train station number two. Now we move on to Soviet Impulse 10. And the only way the Soviets can uh, beef up the areas that they have for, in preparation for German attacks, uh, later is by regrouping. And uh, in doing that, they will probably have to sacrifice some of the outer areas that they have control of. So the Soviets will regroup, moving every uh, friendly unit on the map. Well, that they want to move one area. So the Soviets will regroup the two worker units here. And they will move them here to uh, Area 46. And this unit here in the Mechetka Woods will regroup to Area 45. This unit here at Area 51 will move to the Mechetka Woods. This unit here in Area 53 will move here to Hill 83.9. Soviet unit, which is in this contested area here in the Triangle Woods, will move here to the Dom Community. Here we see the situation in the south of the city. 
is pretty tight in terms of Soviet units. Any uh, regrouping here will give uh, practically uh, control of an area, will leave an area open for the Germans. So any, regr any regrouping from here to here will just give this area away. So there will be no regrouping in this part of town. So now we move on to the German 10th impulse. Now the Germans activate area 10 and all four units move into train station number two. Now we have a mandatory combat situation there. The lead units are selected. The Germans will use the artillery support for the 94th division in this attack and one air support marker. Now we determine the air support marker's strength. And it is five, so the attack value of the Germans is four, plus three units, seven, divisional integrity, eight, artillery support, 10, and air support brings it up to 15. Soviet strength, on the other hand, is two for the unit, plus uh, the terrain effects modifier of three, that's five, and the rubble brings it up to six. So it's 15, the Germans, 6, the Soviets. Now we roll 2d6 on each side. 9 for the Germans, 7 for the Soviets. And again, that 9 is now lower than the impulse number. So that will definitely change the impulse from daylight to nighttime. So impulse number 11 will be a nighttime impulse but going getting back to this attack the germans have a total attack strength of 24 and the soviets 13 so that's another german success and 11 attrition points soviet unit is wiped out and now we have to reduce the lead attack german unit and in normal circumstances germans would have uh, been able to conduct an overrun, but because there's rubble in train station number two, um, there will be no overrun at all. So that's the end of this 10th German impulse. And now we proceed to the 11th impulse, and we begin with the Soviets. It's nighttime. And it is during night impulses that the Soviets can cross the Volga. And also during night impulses, the Soviets can activate one area and either zone L or M, which are the zones that are across the Volga from the city and, uh, and the zones from which units enter the city by rolling on the dreaded Soviet Volga crossing table. And it is in night impulses that the Soviets can cross the Volga. And also during night impulses, if the Soviets take, for example, an assault impulse, they can activate one area and zone L or M. And again, zones L and M are the zones from which units enter the city by crossing the Volga. So the question is, will the Soviets conduct an assault impulse or a non-assault uh, regroup impulse. For making a decision, let's take a look at how the Soviet Volga crossing table works. Two dice are rolled, so the maximum result you can get with two dice is 12, but there are modifiers that apply. And right now, the Germans control Mamayev Kurgan. So that's a plus two right there, and the other modifiers are dependent on where exactly are we going to uh, cross into. Let's take a look at the possibilities. There's a series of crossing arrows in uh, zone M. Let's start with the ones here uh, to the south of the city. We see crossing arrows there, but the problem is that uh, they cannot cross into a German controlled area. So the lumber mill is out of the question. Uh, they could cross into the food combine. That one is controlled by the Soviets, but it has the 
uh, situation that both adjacent areas are controlled by the Germans and that adds to the die roll. That adds plus four on top of the plus two for German control of Mamayev Kurgan. And I see there that the prospects, uh, there's always a possibility of rolling a total of uh, 18. That, and that would be uh, 12 from the dice plus six, 18. But that's very unlikely. But if they roll a 10 or 11, we're going to have a 16, 17 result. And a 14-15 uh, unit would not suffer any losses, but can't move. And that's more probable. So uh, those prospects of crossing uh, with that plus six are pretty grim. So one area they can cross into could be the food combine. They can't cross into the Volga station because that's controlled by the Germans. They could cross into the 9th January square but it would have the same modifier, uh, plus six, because uh, both adjacent areas are controlled by the Germans. And that's, uh, those are the uh, areas in which it can cross into. So which one will it be? A downside of crossing into the food combine is that only two of the units would be able to make it there if they are lucky because of stacking. There's a maximum stacking limit in this game of four units. So if we send two of uh, the regiments of the 13th Guard Rifle Division, we will be splitting the division, which means that later if we want to attack, if the Russians want to attack with that division, they wouldn't get the plus one for divisional integrity. So, Rodimstev and his regiments will cross here at this crossing point into the 9th of January Square. They will attempt to cross. And the Soviets will take an assault impulse. And because of the night rules, they can activate one area and Zone M, which is where we have the 13th era. Guards Rifle Division uh, ready to cross the Volga. And uh, the Soviets will first activate the 9th of January area for the purpose of attempting to build fortifications. The Soviets need with one die four or more and there's a plus one because this is an urban area. So we roll one d6. And in this second attempt to build a fortification, they also roll a 4 modified to a 5. So that area is now fortified. And it has right now a defense of 10. And now we activate Zone M. And uh, the 13th Guards Rifle Division will attempt to cross the ball gun. We will go from left to right. And we will roll two D6s and add plus six. Let's take a look at the possible results once again. If a 12 is rolled, the unit will be eliminated. 10 or 11, that will result in 16 or 17. The unit will suffer an attrition point and may not move. 14 or 15, that, that is rolled with eight or nine. The unit does not suffer any losses, but may not move. So, the Soviets are hoping for 6 or 7, in which case the unit will suffer an attrition point but may move, or 5 or less. Actually, 5 or less is best. So this, this is really uh, pressing on the Soviets because you don't want this division waiting one more turn to cross in the hopes that things will get better on the other side. They probably won't. So. We start with the 39th Infantry Regiment. We roll 2d6. 11 modified to a 17. It was almost eliminated. It suffers an attrition point. And we flip it and it cannot cross. So now we roll for the 34th Regiment. A 5 modified to an 11. So that unit can move into the intended area and continue to move or attack. 
and it rolls a 5 modified 2011. It can cross the Volga into Area 25 and continue moving or having combat with no loss. So that one is across safely. It uh, now will await the fate of the 42nd uh, Regiment. So we roll 2d6. And the result is a 7 modified to a 13. The unit suffers an attrition point but can cross uh, to the other side, to Area 25, and may continue to move or attack, but the Soviets decide to leave both uh, new regiments, newly crossed regiments, right where they are to leave both uh, newly crossed units right where they are. And that's the end of the Soviet 11th Impulse. Now we proceed to the Germans' 11th Impulse. And this is uh, the first night impulse where the Germans will uh, ex execute an action here. Their uh, air units cannot fly during night all artillery units have been expended during the turn. So this is a good uh, opportunity for the Germans actually to regroup and um, try to get their forces concentrated for attacks during the next turn. So the Germans will take a regroup uh, impulse of their own so they can activate every friendly unit on the map and move it one area or zone and of course, uh, no Volga crossings, that applies to the Soviets. So here we see that the uh, 94th Infantry Division took over train station number two. And we have uh, this uh, 29th Division in two areas, but this area is not adjacent to any enemies. So uh, these three units of the 29th uh, Infantry Division will regroup to Area number four, the lumber mill. And let's see the action further here to the west. We see there that Dubovaya Woods is still in Soviet control. With a regroup impulse, you can't enter any units into uh, enemy controlled zone, uh, zo uh, zones or areas, even though they're empty. See there, a regiment of the German 71st Infantry Division, which is separated from the bulk of the division that is currently here at Mamayev Kurgan. So, that regiment will regroup here to Stalingradsky Airfield. And this independent infantry regiment in Area 18 will regroup here to Area 20. And moving further here to what is the north actually? We see that uh, the 516th Regiment of the 295th Infantry Division will regroup here to Hill 107.5. And we see the units of the 389th Infantry Division. There is one back at Gorodice. And that unit here in Gorodice will regroup here to the farm. And this uh, reduced unit in the farm will regroup to the Triangle Woods, which is actually controlled by the Germans. Now there's some German units here in the outskirts and the perimeter zones. There's a unit there at Canil Station, which is uh, Zone G. And uh, the Germans want to hold on to that zone. That's one of the supply zones. So that unit will stay put there. And the Germans also have uh, a Panzer Regiment in the uh, battalion there at Optinok Pole State Farm and two here in Zone K. So one of these, Camp Group 3, 
will regroup to zone H and we will see now this recon battalion will regroup to area 65 and that takes care of all this uh, regrouping by the Germans they will leave this uh, regiment here in order in order to uh, discourage the Soviets from attempting to uh, move into uh, empty areas in the vicinity so that's the end of the German 11th impulse there were no battles so we have to roll 2d6 for the logistical die roll or dice roll and if it's less than 11 which is most probable the turn will end there will not be an impulse number 12 so we roll 2d6 and the roll is a 10 so that's the end of this uh, actual uh, maneuvers phase there will be no impulse number 12 now we go to the next phase and that is the refit phase uh, the Germans receive one replacement point they spend it to uh, flip any units back to full strength or uh, bring one eliminated uh, independent unit back then the Soviets spend two replacement points and there's a free zone German refit where they can flip one unit back to full strength in, in one of those zones and the Derzinski tractor factory the Soviets can bring a previously eliminated independent armor unit uh, back to the game by placing it there full strength if that uh, area ever receives a rubble marker that's the end of that uh, form of uh, tank production in the game then we make surrender checks and there's one unit that surrendered that we will see if it surrenders and then we see the if there's any change of control of, of vacant out of supply areas so first the Germans receive one replacement point now with one replacement point the Germans can uh, flip back to full strength any reduced strength unit that they have in an area that can trace supply back to zones D, E, F or G. So uh, just two units they can flip back to full strength. So which ones will those be? Well, taking a look at the uh, areas where the Germans have concentrated forces next to uh, victory point areas that are worth two victory points uh, that's this is the southern part of the city so the Germans have the 24th Panzer Division there which are the units with the uh, wine colored background and the uh, light purple or brown uh, 29th Infantry Division so they will flip back from the 29th Infantry Division, one of their infantry regiments. So that consumes half of a replacement point. And of the 24th Panzer Division, they will flip to full strength the uh, Recon Battalion. That has a strength now of 7. So the Soviets have observed where the Germans are beefing up, and they have two replacement points to spend. Plus, they can bring a previously uh, eliminated independent armored unit at the Dersinsky tractor factory, and we'll do that first. The Soviets have a previously eliminated armored regiment, so that unit is placed in the Dersinsky tractor factory. And we have tank production going on while the battle is raging. The Soviets have two replacement points to spend. They have a reduced unit, that's an independent infantry unit in the Red Barracks, and uh, more importantly, they have reduced uh, units from the 13th uh, Guards Rifle Division. So they will spend half a point to uh, flip each one to full strength, and in doing so, they spend one replacement point. And they can use half of that replacement point to flip this uh, unit in the red barracks. But because they don't have any reduced, any other reduced units on the map, they would lose uh, the 
the remaining half point. So having one point left, they can bring back a previously eliminated unit at reduced strength. The Soviets are going to bring back this uh, unit, which is the 42nd Naval Infantry Brigade, but it's going to come back at reduced strength. So we take this unit at reduced strength and place it with the Soviet units that will come in during turn number two. Notice that this was a worker unit that was eliminated the turn before. And worker units also automatically come in as reinforcements in the next turn. Germans can flip the full strength any reduced unit that they have in one of the perimeter zones. Uh, but the thing is that all the units they have in perimeter zones are, are at full strength, so um, they get no such benefit in this refit phase. Now we make surrender checks for any units that are in an area uh, from which they cannot trace supply. Soviet units trace supply back to zones L or M, and they have a unit there uh, in the uh, Ovrashnaya woods, which is area 32, which is completely surrounded by uh, areas with German units and uh, areas under German control. And here we see the surrender die roll table. And uh, we roll 1d6 on a 1 or 2, the unit is eliminated, 3 or 4 reduced. If at full strength, eliminated if reduced. This unit particularly is at full strength. And 5 or 6, no effect. There is a plus 1 die roll modifier if the area contains a fortification marker or a rubble marker or both. It doesn't. So, let's see what happens. We roll 1d6 and the roll is a 2. So, the unit surrenders. And it is eliminated. Because it's an independent unit, we place it in the corresponding box of the Soviet reinforcement card. There are no other surrounded areas, but now we change control of out of supply areas that those are the ones that can't trace supply. That Soviet area uh, in which that uh, unit that surrender was in, area 32, cannot trace supply back to uh, uh, the uh, Soviet zones L or M. So now it will be a German controlled area and we remove the Soviet control marker to uh, denote this change in control. There are more empty areas under Soviet control that cannot trace supply to zones L and M. And we see them here, uh, area 19, area 29. So they are now under German control. All other areas can trace supply to their respective edges. So that is the end of the refit phase. And now to the end phase. Here we check for German automatic victory. No, that would be uh, so if they controlled right now all the riverbank areas, and that's not the case. We reset the impulse marker. So the impulse marker returns to box number one of the impulse track. And all of these artillery markers are placed in the German support markers box with their unused sides showing. So we place them in the support box. The Soviet side, we flip the used artillery support markers and the used hero marker to their unused sides. And notice that the storm group marker was not used because the Soviets didn't attack at night. If they would have, this support marker functions in the same way as the German air support markers. The Soviets roll 1d6 and the result of the die roll is the strength that that support marker adds to the Soviet attack. Flip the advantage marker back to the German side. Advance the turn marker now to turn number two. 
Notice that throughout the turn, I didn't uh, tally the victory points. Let's do it now. The, only the Germans accumulate victory points. They have the lumber mill, so that's one victory point. The Volga station, also known as the docks, that's two victory points, so we're at three. They have the oil refinery, that's one victory point, so we're at four. And the Lazur chemical factory, one more, that's five. Victory point marker should be in the five box, and that's the VP times one mark. We end the phase by checking for a German operational victory. Well, they, they have five victory points in areas that can trace supply back to uh, zones D, E, F, or G. So it's five. If the Germans would have had 10 victory points that can trace such supply, that would be the end of the game. But this is the end of turn number one in this mechanics at play video. I've uh, gone at a slow pace so you can uh, appreciate what the mechanics of this game are. And this is a very interactive game. Uh, we see here that the Soviets lost 11 units which have uh, colors for their formations. These units, once lost, do not return to the game. So this is a tremendous blow for the Soviets. There's three independent units still in the eliminated Soviet independent units box. And here we see the units that would arrive in turn two. It's another one of those uh, formations. 95th RD Division, uh, together with the worker unit that always returns as a reinforcement, and the uh, 42nd Naval Infantry Brigade, which was uh, reconstructed. So that's the Soviet's reinforcement card. Here we see the unit that the Germans would receive as a reinforcement, a single Panzer Regiment, although a strong one. And in turn four, they would receive the 100th Light Division and uh, also additional Kampgruppe uh, Panzer regiments. The rest of the reinforcements are for the campaign game that takes the game up to turn number 10. So this is the end of this Mechanics at Play video. We played a full turn of Verdun on the Volga. I found the rules very clear. Uh, uh, system very elegant notice that counter clutter is non-existent you don't have those ugly duration counters that turning point Stalingrad had and you don't have the situation that you had in that game that when you uh, uh, attacked with a particular unit that unit was out of action for a number of turns uh, which is kind of unrealistic actually because it's uh, a measured uh, fixed number of turns depending on the activity it, it realized so the enemy knows that uh, a unit that you used to attack was going to be out of action, and that's not uh, realistic at all. This system is a lot more elegant. Here you could conceivably activate the same uh, formation repeatedly, but given the attritional nature of combat in this game, where even if you win a battle, your lead unit will be reduced. The more you activate your units, uh, the more they will suffer uh, losses. So you have to take it easy, suck it in, let the day become night, and then replace and uh, refit your units. The Germans only have one replacement point. Uh, they have a chance if they uh, have the advantage marker at uh, the end of the maneuvers phase, then they may use it to gain an additional replacement point. But a savvy Soviet player will probably try to avoid that. Uh, situation. So the Germans have very few ways of strengthening their units. They can flip or reduce unit to full strength if it's in one of the zones, but see how far these zones are. So theoretically you could move one of those uh, uh, reduce units to these zones and then in the refit phase you get, you can uh, turn to full strength just one unit in one of those zones. So it's not also a lot. So it's a very attritional combat system, very elegant uh, and uh, replayable because you don't know when the turn is going to end, when day will become night, 
when the Germans have to declare a logistical pause that we didn't see in this particular uh, uh, video because it can't happen in the first turn. So uh, I will be publishing in BGG these cards. These are what I call the poker-sized player aid cards. I use them for this video and they have information that is not in the uh, player aid card uh, proper. There is a sequence of play but just ha it only has the titles of the phases. So I'm gonna double check it and upload the these cards for those of you who are interested. And this is the end of this video and I hope that this video has given you an idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.